So yeah, I think we'll we'll get started. Um, the room is, as you are probably all aware, a little difficult to find. Thank you for your fortitude in finding it, but it, it certainly means we might have some people trickling in, um, which is fine. So thank you all so much for coming um, to this talk with uh, Veitch Brenner, who is a Berlin-based theater artist from Showcase, working with the, um, and a founder of the company Showcase Viet Le Mans, which we'll talk about more, um, and Matt, Matt Cornish um, from Ohio University. I'll introduce them uh, in a second, but just wanted to say, I'm, I'm Corey Tamler, I'm in the, um, the Department of Theater here at the Graduate Center, and I'm a graduate student, um, and really happy to welcome you all also from, on behalf of the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center that is helping to co-produce this and has been really wonderful in supporting us and uh, also supporting a workshop that we did this morning with Fight and a number of uh, about a dozen PhD students across a few different departments that I think was really fruitful and, and interesting. Um, and uh, the Siegel Center, for those of you who don't know, produces a lot of events throughout the year that are, that are really wonderful artist talks like this. And um, they have the Prelude Festival coming up uh, that most of you probably know about, but that's full of um, New York City-based artists and uh, um, that shows a lot of works in progress that you'll then see out on stages throughout the next few seasons, and that's October 4th, 5th, and 6th, I think, and everything's free and open to the public, so that's definitely something to, um, to come back for um, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll introduce um, Matt and Fight. You have, uh, there are programs, um, if you want to read our bios in a little more detail, but I'll just give some of the um, Cliff's notes. Uh, so Veit Sprunger is a director and author and producer um, who studied music in Hanover and medicine in Frankfurt and applied theater science in Gießen, so a, a polymath after my own heart. Um, he's a founder of the theater company Showcase Beat Le Mans. Um, he has co-curated a number of festivals and been a jury member in, for many more. Um, he's taught in many art academies in Berlin, in Hamburg, Gießen, uh, and et cetera. Um, he has, uh, he's also a scholar, has written many, has numerous writings about contemporary theater. Um, including the book Despoten auf der Bühne, Despots on the Stage, um, and several theatrical adaptations, including his prize-winning version of Animal Farm. Uh, so welcome, Fight. Thanks for Thank coming. Uh, Matt Cornish is, the, is Assistant Professor of Theater History at Ohio University. Um, his first book, Performing Unification, History and Nation in German Theater after 1989, uh, is just out, yeah, from or, out now. Yeah, yeah, just freshly out from University of Michigan Press. Um, and he's also at work editing a collection of contemporary German performance texts, including texts from Showcase um, and Gob Squad and the Mini Protocol and others. Um, that'll be published in the spring. Uh, he's had a, a Fulbright Research Fellowship um, and a DAAD, both at the FU in Berlin. Um, and he received his Doctor of Fine Arts from Yale. Um, so yeah, thank you both again for coming and thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're both coming from Ohio now. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> from Fresh all the way Ohio. from the Midwest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. So um, yeah, I I wonder should we uh, we spoke about it a little bit at lunch. If we should give you a quick run through the work I do with Showcase, show some photos. Problem is, some of you have already seen them, like you and you, um, and, and it will be, and you too, actually, also. 
So for you it will be extremely very boring. You can go drink a coffee. Well, some of us like boring theater. Yes, <laughs> so do I. Yeah. I love so, boring theater. It's yeah. the only truth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's joy in repetition. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, but I will make it sort of quick. Um, uh, this photo uh, shows, well, us, uh, 20 years ago, um, uh, taking our bow for our very first piece, uh, but not in the end of the piece, but at its beginning. Mm -hmm. And taking that bow in front of an audience, uh, we do several things. We spit a red color that we have in our mouth into four aquariums. Behind these aquariums, you have these these uh, neon lights, and the the little magic theater magic that we do there makes the white light in the space turn red. Um, <coughs> when we started out as a group, uh, the uh, situation in Germany was not so living room like that we like it, like uh, people sitting uh, sharing one space like we do here. That was not usual um, in 1998, so um, we had to develop audiences in a way to share these spaces with us and to create them with us. Um, this is a show, it, it's not chronological, this is a show from 2006 that we did much later that has um, a little bit the same effect that we sort of uh, concentrate our theater magic but only in one space that is like an aquarium in which we are now and we have all the theater effects available here like we have, uh, we can make two million different light effects, light colors. With that we have a wind machine in there, we have um, a fog machine and a soap bubble machine, and we have a stroboscope, we have all the music in there, so like the whole theater technique is gathered in that little space and the people are sitting around it and not really getting what is going on, but watching us being our own audience in a way. Um, <clears throat> this is a piece that we did in 2011, it's called Alles, Everything. And when you enter uh, the, the theater space, you are confronted with a cinema situation that people would look at a kind of screen and there would be this plateau-like shadow theater going on for a while, like for 20, 30 minutes usually before they, uh, before they realize that there is a place behind the curtain and they can actually go there and it's much nicer because then they can see how it's all done. Uh, there are also sofas available there backstage, like backstage there is a bar where they can order drinks, there is somebody cooking a soup that is then given out to people. Um, and what happens is that the people wander around so that some of them go back to the normal audience space watching at the shadow situation. Some others stay in the backstage area for the whole time. Uh, we like making people move around in space, like more, more in an, I would say, in an art space where you go around the sculptures. Uh, yeah, so this is some, uh, yeah, this is some sort of real magic that we do, uh, it's, it's more, I won't explain much about that. This is from our last piece, uh, Gefühle, Feelings. Um, uh, doing a piece about feelings is difficult to us because we don't have any. So, uh, so what we did was we, we took out the heart of one of the performers and we showed it to the audience. It didn't actually beat it. it. Beat it? No. That's it beat. It beat. It beat, and when, uh, depending on what texts we told it, it beat faster <laughs> or slower. <laughs> uh, we also sang to it. Um, as we are, mm, well, not professionally trained as actors, we are trying to give ourselves different rules than acting naturally. So the task is acting unnaturally, uh, non-naturally, and the easiest way to achieve this, actually, I think, is um, by creating some kind of games that follow certain rules. Like, for example, in this scene, 
which is again from our very first piece in 98. Uh, we cover a pop song, uh, but we play the guitars that are hanging from the ceiling and we have to jump very high to get the right chord and mm. to, to uh, well, to put a toothbrush to the side and to the uh, strings. That's right. Uh, this is a choreography um, inspired by the Backstreet Boys, uh, um, but with ski shoes, which is much more fun. This is uh, a show that we keep repeating somehow until today. Uh, it's, it's a blindfolded soccer situation. So you have a little bell in this ball, and we are blindfolded. There is a referee, uh, and uh, the situations I like most is when the ball is lying somewhere in the corner and everybody is running around trying to find it so so it gives a very weird kind of choreography and of course at that point uh, uh, the audience comes in helping us uh, telling us where the ball is but as everybody shouts at the same time we can't really get it we can't hear anything mm -hmm. uh, we tried several versions of this mm -hmm. in uh, at ohio ohio yeah we were very bad at it <laughs> well, soccer, you know, at the soccer. Yeah. <laughs> You're supposed to be bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, like, like uh, artificial handicaps. Yeah. If the hat is too big, you don't see what you're doing on stage. Or then uh, mm. you you do hard uh, uh, sewing work in an in a body armor, which makes it quite difficult. Or you say text while a wind machine is blowing to your faces. Uh, or you uh, do uh, baroque minuet dances on a platform that is actually moving to the right and to the left, so you try to be s as symmetrical as possible, but of course this doesn't always happen and uh, the, the, the platform goes to one side and makes a very loud and shocking noise that disturbs the music and the dance. Yeah, here you see the platform again. Um, this is from a kid's piece. We had, uh, we are four and we have to play eight roles all together. So we built furniture. So our theater roles were like, were like furniture standing around and we could, uh, well, we could just slip in and out again very, very fast. And the kids got it all right. Um, yeah, this is Animal Farm. Uh, it's the same principle, but uh, with different figures. Those are the animals uh, and as soon as somebody stands in front of them of course they are the according animal it doesn't have to be him for that animal it can be him it can be me um, children got it very well um, there are the artificial handicaps and there are the, the natural handicaps like not being able to by heart a written text so what we do is we uh, we write it on each other's skin in order to read it during the show. Or then we write it on parts of the stage set up that we slowly unbuild, reading from it, and at the end the whole setup is unbuilt. Uh, we use instruments as costumes uh, and as a way to have dialogue. Uh, we use, uh, this is from our piece Alarm Shanghai, we use cardboard boxes to build the Chinese wall, but of course we use them also in very different other, way, uh, other ways. Uh, for example, in order to transport our props on our tour. Um, yeah, this is a space that I like very much somehow. Um, it's from our show uh, Bonjour Commune. And it uses a kind of camouflage technique. So when you are in the space, you don't really get its depth. You don't know how it works. It's it's kind of it's confusing you. Um, and in the course of this uh, show, uh, it turns out that actually text is projected. And as soon as we start carrying objects uh, around the space, this text uh, can be read. Yeah. So uh, slowly. Uh, there is put some kind of order uh, to this that the people can understand. This is a stage setup that we did in 2000. Uh, our whole setup consists of um, of truck tires and pullovers. Um, it's uh, it's a thing inspired by Erwin Wurm. I don't know if you know him. It's 
German artist uh, who, who did installations with clothes, uh, misusing them in some way or another. Uh, yeah. Um, this is, we recycled the idea for a later piece for kids about bugs, and of course you can see that here we, we use everyday objects to, yeah, to build our costumes. Um, this is from from a fairy tale, uh, Die Bremer Stadtmusikanten. What did you say? What was it in English? The Bremen Town Musicians. The Bremen Town Musicians. This is a Theremin. Uh, he's the donkey, and whenever he moves his ears, it's an instrument that you play without touching. Whenever he moves his ears, of course, it gives a different kind of music. When the rooster starts to fly, these little accordions will start to play. Um, this is a, a piece of furniture that we used in our piece about the Middle Ages. Uh, it is connected to organ uh, flutes. So whenever somebody sits down here to take a rest, these flutes would start to play a beautiful chord. This is a machine, um, uh, also a multitasking object, I would say. It's a plexiglass cube that is filled with foam. And it can be used in very different ways, like like a lamp or like a hiding place for performers. Or then it can get you a costume when you step out of it. This is um, again from the medieval piece we did. Uh, we worked with a Buto dancer, a Japanese Buto dancer, and uh, he, this gentleman, danced in a in a machine for where you put grapes, yes, so mm -hmm. the grape juice, while he danced, and the while he danced, the more, of course, uh, uh, flowed out of this machine into the bucket and could be, uh, we could drink it afterwards. This is Minako Seki, our uh, choreographer that we employed for this very piece, but we worked with her quite often. Uh, generally, we like to work with people who uh, who are somehow far out for us. So Bhutto is really not something that is uh, written in our body memories. Um, and it's also very alien to, to the theme that we uh, <coughs> deal with, uh, like a, a revolution in the late Middle Ages in, uh, in northern Germany. But somehow this strangeness fitted quite well. This is uh, again from our piece about the French Revolution. Um, uh, it's, it's the guillotine that is at the same time used to cut open uh, melons that are afterwards served to the audience. We like serving food because uh, this gives well, it, it gives an atmosphere where you where you feel that you are part of the thing, but at the same time you are not in the situation to have to perform like uh, to, to to be participation like it is sometimes done and yeah I'm very afraid of this situation as an audience always uh, I tend to shut down and uh, eating opens people up now I have the impression or drinking um, this is again from our show Gefühle uh, we prepare a kind of still life that is presented to the people and uh, what always happens in these situations is that you have this moment of a Fragezeichen, question mark, uh, what to do now uh, with this uh, beautiful installation. And after 10, 15, 20 minutes, people get the idea and start eating. In some cities, like in Vienna, it's, it stays very long, uh, an open situation, because people are very respectful. In Berlin, uh, five minutes are around. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Won't tell anything about this. Uh, this is uh, our, yeah, uh, um, a situation where we leave the audience completely alone. It's uh, a piece called "Vote Zombie Andy Boyce" about Andy Warhol and Joseph Boyce. It's an installation that we toured uh, through different spaces, but yeah, uh, the, in this cube, the, uh, you, we arrange chairs. People come in, find out that they can take out chairs and uh, start sitting and wait for the show to start but actually it has started uh, long ago yes 
and uh, in fact we are around the space doing our things and when when or if it quiets down on the inside they will hear us working doing our little performance work after some time they get bored they discover different possibilities in the space they discover wine they discover food they start rearranging stuff and having fun here we come in we are here in this box mm -hmm. and we go out you can see us on a, on a screen uh, filmed by a, um, by a temperature camera yeah, so you can get an idea that there are human beings in that thing sometimes you see our legs um, this is the moment where the audience gets active um, rearranging the space this is um, yeah a, a, a similar situation from the Gefühle piece um, the sport here is the idea is to to cross a very big uh, theater space without being seen uh, with and without being seen active absence yes you could call it so after we have served some wine to the folks we crawl under the table we cr uh, crawl through a shawl well through through a flexible tube uh, into another tube we perform a ritual here then you will see us crawl on here uh, to the back of this wall then through the wall we are visible for a short moment and then we leave the theater and this is yeah this is what is actually when we are gone what is seen it's a giraffe skeleton it's uh, what we produced while we were uh, if you remember while we were in this tube so it's like the riddle is solved in a way yeah this is uh, another way of treating audiences um, that worked quite fine in our piece animal farm the the youngsters between 14 and 16 they are not very patient when they are exposed to theater and um, so we gave them the opportunity to to be in this dark room yeah and they had uh, a stroboscope in there so they had quite a lot of effects but it was basically it was pitch dark and they had a trampoline so they could and the walls were soft so they could really mess around in there and fall around and of course uh, after some quarter of an hour there was an incredible noise in there that we again used as a um, acoustic background for our animal tales. This is a theater that we built in 2014. <coughs> it's called Ding Dong Doom. Um, we were sort of fed up with black box situations uh, and their neutrality, so we wanted to build a theater that is like the contrary of a black box. So what would that be? It, it would be a theater consisting uh, of, of, of windows, yeah? So, yeah, well, the idea is if you open the windows, the theater dis disappears, it's not there anymore. Um, and uh, the space from inside uh, was very flexible. Um, we created very different situations uh, there. Uh, in the background here, when you go through this door, you have the river Spree. And when, again, when you go to the, uh, through the other door, you have a little garden. So it's this idea of French theater, Côté Cour, Côté Jardin, since we are with theater histo history uh, people here. Um, and uh, this was, in a way, our Festspielhaus for our uh, Nazi trash performance. Uh, um, uh, that we did as a series, as a series of altogether 12 evenings. Um, yeah, and this is a thing that we did on, in the countryside with locals. We, we spent time at the local brewery. It's like what, what you have in Ohio, these garage breweries. Mm -hmm. They are coming up in Germany also. Um, and it turned out to be a meeting point of the youth but also of the grown-ups, and we asked people to bring their old furniture that they didn't need anymore. And out of that, we built this burnout man. And people were also invited to put in 
well, things they were attached to, but they didn't want anymore, like old love letters, photographs, etc. And at the end, this was ritually burned down. What year was that? That was um, very recent. Uh, right? uh, 2015. It actually looks like the Burning Man, man. And <laughs> yes, you're, you're it's it's inspired by, by that. Yeah. And, 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 and the temples of. Uh, uh, at Burning Man? The temples? Yeah, because in the temples they put in things, messages, yeah, and then yeah, they right. burn the temple the day after they burn the man. Yeah, right. It's inspired by that. It's it, Basically, it's that idea. Mm -hmm. Except that uh, the figure is made of furniture that is also given to us by the people. Mm. So we're going to have a pretty free-flowing conversation, I think, about theater in Germany, about Showcase's work, about how this kind of work gets made. Um, do we want to stay in this room, or is it a, is it a little bit crowded and warm? We could go in the central area too, if people want to. That's um, not our space, though. We'd have to go to. Oh, our okay. Room. We'd have to go to it. Okay, We'd that's fine. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So uh, I can certainly ask plenty of questions, but I, we can start by opening things up to uh, to the audience uh, about. Uh, should we start with showcases work? Any any questions that that you guys want to know? about showcases work? Sure, yeah, I can, I can start by asking. Um, like one of the things that came back is uh, you said you like to move audiences around. Uh, so I was wondering like basically why um, and what's, what do you find interesting about uh, you know, the active audience? Uh, maybe, I, uh, maybe I put it wrongly. I think uh, what we do can only be properly seen when you move around because our spaces are so complicated that you never get the whole picture. And as, um, yeah, many things are happening at the same time. There are walls in between, there are curtains in between. So uh, it's like a landscape. And of course you can look at a landscape like the romantic uh, uh, concept of Caspar David Friedrich mm -hmm. from a mountain. Um, but of course you can also uh, wander around in, in the landscape and in a way become a part of it and so yeah mm -hmm. so, so it's it. not basically it's not it's not okay let's make a piece about people moving around mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so this this work is part of what in Germany is called the Freizeit or independent scene or free scene uh, theater. What's the relationship between that and the national theater scene in Germany? How how do you interact with these big state theaters that um, that have existed for many many years in Germany? Yeah, of years? yeah. Since a few years, we do. Yeah. Um, we are well. Um, we have. The, 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 one of the biggest fund organization in Germany is the Bundeskulturstiftung and they make programs in order to well what what they observe is that um, the national theaters are much too big for the small towns they are built in <laughs> it's a concept from another century yeah it's uh, uh, the spaces are not up to date anymore when it comes to <coughs> performance techniques and to the needs of audiences and actually of, of performers, of, of artists. So, um, and the youngsters run away or don't come or are not interested mm -hmm. in what happens there. So how to gather young audience, I'm not a good example for this, I'm not a youngster anymore, but, but how, to, how to bring sort of everyday people into the theater again. And um, they watched uh, the free scene and they observed that much more uh, interdisciplinary exchange happens there between music, dance, um, building the Kunst, uh, visual, 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 visual arts, yeah. arts, science, and it attracts a, a more um, heterogeneous uh, uh, audience. So how to bring that energy into the big theater houses, and they, they really they make programs every one two years. They make they get new new ideas how to inspire the national theaters to invite free 
ensembles and how to encourage free ensembles to go work with the national theatres. And it works very differently, but um, <clears throat> usually I would say what we produce in a national theatre is national theatre. Maybe it's quite good national theatre or exceptional national theatre, but still the aesthetics somehow are grounded. And it's, for us, I would say it's not our best work that is done there, but it's, in the best case, it's a mediocre state of the arts <laughs> thing that we can achieve there. But this is, uh, I know it's a pretty pessimistic point of view, or it sounds pessimistic. Basically, I believe in this cooperation. And, um, but, but still, is, it, it always has a character of a compromise. So what are, what are some of the characteristics of working in a national theater? So you have to work with, like, in, instead of doing stuff where it's just the four of you or an invited guest, you have to make things with, a, with actual professional theater uh, actors. Uh, what, are so, what are some of the other constrictions that you face when you're, when you're doing we, that? We have to work with the classically trained uh, actors. Mm -hmm. um, and because they have their ensembles mm -hmm. that they pay anyway. So when they invite a group like us, it's extra cost, yes? Mm -hmm. But uh, still they will pay uh, their actors. Uh, and of course they want them to be involved in what we do. So um, as they have a very different way of working, like for example, they want to have text before the rehearsals start. We don't have text before the rehearsals start. Or even they want to have ideas before the rehearsal start. Mm -hmm. And we don't have ideas till after the premiere, mostly. So uh, there is a kind of pressure on both sides. Plus, of course, you have the technical situation that you, um, uh, there is the Bauprobe, the famous. Uh -huh. the, the famous uh, German Bauprobe. The famous yeah. German Bauprobe that takes place. Which like, is uh, it's like a, like it's a, like a technical, like a technical rehearsal, rehearsal yeah. and everything. Yes. But is yeah, all together. But more, more everything. Yeah. And 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 even for them, it's quite early, which means it's like one two months before rehearsal starts. But for us, not knowing anything, it's extremely early. It's absurd. It's just yeah. absurd. <laughs> what we did once with a, it, but I have to say, it depends on the theater and the on the people working there. It's always that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what we did once is just tell that. Yeah. We, we sat in a room like this with all the members of the ensemble, which was about this number we have now. And we said, we don't know yet, so what to do? Mm -hmm. And um, somehow this got, uh, got us much more acceptance mm -hmm. than when we try to model something that in the end is mm -hmm. trashed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wondered if both of you could, because you talked a little bit this morning about text in Showcase's work and, and sort of positioned yourself as the writer of the group in a way, and then Matt's working, been working on this book of performance text that includes Showcase's work and also, and just other texts that, um, that are not necessarily easy to translate and compile, that, that have a different relationship um, than the sort of like what we're what we're used to from traditional playwriting, um, other texts from the free scene. Um, so, I I would be curious to hear both of you talk about how text um, works in in the free scene specifically or in your own work. Do you want to start and talk about showcase specifically? Okay, I will take showcase and you yeah. take the big picture. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. With us, <coughs> um, it's it's different. Uh, we actually have. A scripted text um, that develops in various ways. Sometimes it's improvisation uh, that gets scripted uh, in order to be super titled when we go on tour or so much later. Uh, sometimes it's um, a collection of ideas that that gets um, distilled, distilled into something pointy. And I think that is a, a work that can uh, be done on your computer in, in your home when you have the voices of your co-performers in the ear somehow. So, so there is both. And then, of course, we steal text from mm -hmm. different sources, like 
the most risky is Bertolt Brecht because <laughs> his, his, his heirs are still alive and they are very strict about everything, but we even stole from him and we are very proud of that. Yeah. But don't tell. <laughs> Camera. Yeah. Do you have a particular text that you go back to again or a particular, you know, I know, for example, one artist in Japan always has to have Beckett in the piece. Ah, okay. so, yeah. Well, we actually, we, for a long time, we worked with Brecht in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, we took some of his pieces, especially uh, Ja Sager und Nein Sager, and well, we wrote uh, a, a, the prequel to it. Mm -hmm. So it was shown, uh, the first we showed the prequel, and then we showed this piece. Um, then we changed some of his stuff, uh, and then we sort of imitated this this, this this form, this poetic that he has, mm -hmm. especially, I, I love uh, the, the language and the poetry that is in it always. So, um, but we do that with other things. We did it with uh, Greek theater. It's, we work with sounds, yeah? What's the sound of a certain form of mm -hmm. a drama? What's the music of it? And we try to uh, sort of distill that, yeah? Uh, for a long time, uh, because you asked, it was it was Brecht. Uh, later, it was um, Kafka. Uh, in the well, he's not a playwright. Well, he is actually. He wrote one fragment, which is beautiful uh, about ghosts. Um, uh, yeah, and then um, there are contemporary novels. Uh, there is for uh, well, uh, this was a Auftragswerk. I forgot again. Um, commission, commission work. Yeah. Commission work. This animal farm thing. We had big, big difficulties with it. Uh, there was a there was a version, an authorized version by the heirs from 1970s. It was horrible, horrible, uh, and we were nearly forced to deal with that one until we said, okay, no, we, we can't. We write our own version, and we okay, we, we pay for the 70s version with the Verlag, with uh, the publisher, with the publisher. That's that's what he, well, that's what we did. So every time we play that piece, uh, this author from the 70s gets some money. But of course, we play our own version of that also. Um, it's difficult to, to deal with, especially with contemporary text, uh, mm -hmm. because you're always an outlaw when you do that, mm -hmm. nearly always. Yeah, this was, a, this was a huge problem in putting the book together, actually, yeah. because I would constantly come across texts that were not just with Showcase, but with many of the different groups that were taken from different areas right and then you have to like figure out can you get uh, a russian widow who lives in a rural area without the internet to give you permission to use a blog post that her husband wrote um <laughs> in the late 1990s right because otherwise the, 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 the <laughs> or or do you just like not tell anybody that you're doing this but we managed to actually to get her to give us permission so yeah yeah, that was that was difficult. Um, uh, but I I'd say generally in the independent scene, this is how texts are created, and there often is a, a kind of starting point like Animal Farm or a Brecht play that that is in the room when they begin, but it also is often just an idea, and I think everything is a great example. Alice is a good example of that, which was alchemy. And it kind of a lot of the texts revolved around alchemy, or were taken from alchemical texts. Um, uh, and for that, uh, there wasn't a kind of a script that you sent me for that was taken on tour, but rather seven, I think at least seven different word documents that mm -hmm. came from multiple people in the group. Mm -hmm. um, and we tried to figure out how do we. This was a three and a half hour performance. The actual text would take. 15, 20 minutes to read, not very, not very long. So we had to figure out how do we present this, how do we create it for readers? And it became a, I told, I told Fight, this started with a really bad idea. How do you take something that's three and a half hours and has not a lot of spoken words and present it as text? And so that was kind of the, the goal of this, of this collection. Um, there was a soup recipe you took it up. Yeah, we use, so they use, they also were creating soup, making soup on stage. And so we decided to include the soup recipe in the book. So you can, you can make the soup recipe while you read the text. 
Um, and it works. The soup recipe works. I've tried it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a pretty regular. It's a it's a vegetable sure, soup. It's, yeah. It's yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I also went in the box in Animal Farm and, and danced with the high schoolers also, because I felt like I should, even though it was very odd as an adult to be to be doing that. All of the name research. Yeah, all the name research. Well, they was all dark, so they couldn't see me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we so and while working on, on translating that, that was one of I think it's the only one in the book that I fully translated by myself. Uh, I found that there were all these alchemical texts that were originally in English. So I had to f I found them in English, but they weren't. And it wasn't a direct translation that they were using into German. So I had to kind of capture the pace of it and the feel of it, um, uh, while also changing some of the words to make sure it was close enough to the to the German. Uh, but you could see they, they use text a lot as kind of material in their performances. They write it on their backs. They write it on the stage <laughs> props. Uh, they put it in giant books and read from it. Um, and uh, so there is a, it's, it is a continuation, I think, of that project, of that materiality of, of the text. Uh, just a question. So who would you say are your forebears? What, what influences you in doing this work? Because a lot of the things you're discussing, I can say, well, I saw this there, that there. So it's kind of like not only a collage of texts, but a collage of behaviors. Uh, and sometimes when things get uh, reenacted, they're reenacted consciously. I took this from that, and some of like the Burning Man thing. And sometimes not. They just happen to be there. So consciously, who do you think you're eating from and digesting mm. and mm. Mm. well um, in the in the uh, late 90s uh, there was uh, Tom Stromberg at the uh, uh, Theater am Turm uh, mm -hmm. I think you would remember yes uh, yes um, and he invited a lot of people that were then very new to us uh, this whole US American performance context was unknown in Germany. It, it, this was uh, a, a white map. Yes, so um, so he invited Reza Abdul. <coughs> yes, yeah. And we were thrilled by that. He he invited John Water with this mm -hmm. Roy Kuhn, Jack Do you Smith. remember from Reza which pieces you used? Uh, the Law of Remains. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. and then the other one with the with the Stacheldraht, with this fence mm -hmm. between um, the audience. Uh, Stacheldraht, barbed wire. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then yeah, and then uh, Ron Water and um, then which, which one of Ron? Uh, Roy Cohn, Jack Smith. Mm -hmm. Then through this piece, we got in contact with Jack Smith's work. Yeah. yeah. So so. I don't know if there are direct ways. There are lots of indirect ways. Um, <coughs> what what I would say are our parents in performance theater are the Backtruppen from Norway. Mm -hmm. Do you remember them? No, no, I no. Don't know yeah, they did. Um, uh, they did uh, one show here in in New York, but um, don't remember when that mm -hmm. was. Uh, they were in a way our elders. Yeah, we, when we were still studying, we watched what they did, and we thought, wow, if this is theater, we want to do theater, th theater too. Um, theoretically, uh, I would say. Uh, um, Richard Foreman, yes. Uh, uh, then, then uh, other disciplines like right. the arts, yes, very much. Uh, Joseph Beuys was important for us. The uh, the performance work of uh, yeah, as I told, Erwin Erwin Boom. Um, then, TV, pop music, mm. very important. Mm. Um, Cinema. So yeah, it's 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 really it's. I wouldn't say it's a potpourri, but uh, when we meet, everybody has had their own experience. I mean, mm -hmm. we are not we are not a couple. We 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 are not together all the time. So we get we spread in different directions. We come back to the table. Everybody has their own ideas. Puts them on the table. The others don't get it. They don't understand it. They misunderstand it. Misinterpret it. Make something else out of it. That's how it works. And then, yeah, th this sounds like 
I'm totally against brainstorming. This is an anti-method. <laughs> I hate it um, be because I miss the strictness. Uh, at one point, the strictness comes in again, mm -hmm. and you have to condense it to something formal, yes, mm -hmm. um, and aesthetically, uh, aesthetically, well, pure, no, but but schlüssig. Uh, uh, um, finished. So, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Polished. Uh, Polished? Huh? Polished? No, no, yeah. schlüssig, uh, well, yeah, it, like this construction, it, it's built and then it stands, you don't know how long, but, uh, you know, it's uh, stable, more or less. Not very stable. <laughs> <laughs> to me, just theoretically, if I could make one point, it seems, uh, in the Renaissance, when uh, Shakespeare took all of these things, you could always say that, Shakespeare never invented a story, or you know, it's Holland Shed, it's Italians, whatever. But he finally makes something completely, he digests it and becomes something else. I think in our day, in your work, and it's not just in your work, the undigestible is very important, that it doesn't get integrated into, quote, a completely new and unrecognizable thing where you need a scholar to find the sources. The people who come may not know what the sources are, but the lumps are still there. Does that make sense to you? Yes, yes. It's um, die, die Brocken sind ah, immer yes. noch da, yeah. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it it never feels right, you know. Um, there is no premiere and there is no dernier. Uh, right. It's never finished. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it changes with the context, with the uh, with the spaces. Although we don't make this our concept, we are not radically, uh, I would, wouldn't say we are radically uh, site-specific, no, not that. But yeah, um, we are not satisfied after two months, three months, after one year, or even after five years have passed, and we look at the old stuff, we are not satisfied anymore. It, it embarrasses us, so it's changed. Yes. As uh, Matt, you started to touch upon this, I'd be a little bit more interested in the act of translation has to become a bit embodied because, and you touch upon it with saying that you were, you went in and you danced with the high schoolers. Uh -huh. So um, because it's durational and because the performance text could read through as 15 minutes, but it, it it's about the experience that happens, how do you see the role of the translator changing um, and, and the artistry and kind of like a sense of embodiment happening with that performance of translation? So this is this is often the case with theater, right? Because it is embodied. So I actually I don't think I I've told you about this, but I actually had the actors at Ohio University who are classic trained classically trained actors perform everything, my translation of everything, um, uh, which I can't believe I didn't tell you about that. But yeah, yeah. Uh, did you film it? I didn't film it. This no. is a beautiful yeah. project. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. And, we, and they also did a Gob Squad piece called Dancing About, which is all about dancing and is a list of improvisational rules, not, not really a script. Um, uh, so we tried, we tried it in time and space in bodies. Um, I made the soup uh, in, in addition to writing down the, or tr trying to translate uh, the recipe. Um, but I'm I'm not a great translator, I have to say. So I don't know. It, it's uh, it was it was a difficult experience because of because of that. I would email them back and forth and get different versions of the text sometimes. And um, oh, we did the program note also. The the program for Alice was a big uh, kind of theoretical text. And the thing about Alice is because it was so long, you would get bored, right? And you would have this thing to read if you wanted to, if you you know, while you were drinking. So we decided to put that in there as well. And do you think would you be able to talk a bit about a more traditional sense of what translation translation is versus translating for independent text? I mean, I think the ones that I've read the most are probably frantic assemblies, which mm. you know, which is what I kind of just mm -hmm. not frantic assemblies. Sorry. Um, uh, Tim Mitchell's. Uh, oh, Tim Mitchell's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Force yeah. Entertainment. Force Entertainment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, there is a lot of Force Entertainment. Uh, uh, in fact, Force Entertainment was in the theater trip in this last year. Um, strangely. Uh, so there, there is a, there is some real crossover there. Uh, it was much louder. 
I guess. Normally, translation for me is very quiet. Uh, but this, I was constantly having the performances in the background, or I would play music from the performances in the background while translating. It's just a much louder process, I guess, than it typically is for me. Um, so you raise an interesting question. Uh, I don't think, I don't know about math, but I don't expect anyone to try to do these works yeah. Yeah. from reading the book. Yeah. I expect them to know about the works, yeah. for the works to be as they exist on the page, which is clearly different than as they exist on the stage or wherever, um, that it's a kind of provocation and not even quite a documentary record, mm -hmm. but um, an idea. Mm -hmm. So, if, like if you look at some of Rabbi Mure's work, someone from the UK at the Tate just wrote me and said, oh, I'm so glad you published his works. You, there are some of Mure's works which are devised, mm -hmm. that's even the right word, which um, can really be read on the page. It's everything he said and he sits at a desk but he's doing this whole visual thing, yeah. Yeah. Right, which is absent, which is very important. But if you've seen the work, the record of the work on the page helps one think through again for yet another writing and yet another provocation. Yeah. So I see it not as like the open theaters, the serpent has pointed out, oh, let's do the serpent. Yeah. Right? I see it. Move, I think it moves in a different direction, and that all these and it's very interesting what you say about translation. So I think it's a really exciting moment in translation studies. Um, uh, there, some of the groups have talked about uh, licensing the situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, Shishi Pop is willing to consider uh, a similar independent, uh, not similar, but an in, also an independent scene group mm -hmm. is is willing to consider licensing the situation of uh, bringing your father onto the stage to do King Lear with you. Uh, but you would have to start at the beginning. I it's think like, they're gonna have yeah. a really hard time yeah. licensing situations. Yeah, yeah, well, they're, so they're, right, they're willing, in Remedy Protocol, their agent will license one of their situations to you. I haven't heard about anybody so doing this. Uh -huh. um, uh, but the idea, they're willing to consider the idea, uh, but mostly they intend it as a kind of, for other artists anyway, as a kind of provocation, mm -hmm. as Carol said, um, as a way of, of thinking through something anew. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's also the idea of fair use. Like, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. not sure you needed to actually contact that grandmother or well, whoever she no. was. <laughs> In other words, yeah. the question of yeah. fair use is, yeah. Am I really trying to do Mother Courage here yeah, on the yeah, sly yeah. and claim authorship? Yeah. Or am I using bits of Mother Courage to make an entirely different yeah. work? Yeah. And they deal with this in film all the time and in music. Yeah. And how many bits are you allowed to use? And how like, many bits are you allowed to use? When, and are you making an original product? Yeah. Yeah. When Heiner Mueller would use Brecht, there was a huge trial that, that happens because he had used too much Brecht, and, and he ended up winning, right? I mean, Miller and his estate contacted me when I yeah. translated um, Hamlet, Hamlet Clone, Carl Murray's text, because oh. Hamlet, Carl Murray had taken Heine Müller's text, yeah. okay. and when, when it was translated into German, yeah. from my translation, they found out. They were sent me a yeah, so I thought it, mostly I thought it would be nice if this widow knew that we were using her husband's text. Um, and, and then yeah. it, uh, the framing on the stage. What, Richard, what was that piece you did where you said the estate wouldn't allow us to do the work, but if, oh, we, yeah. but if, well, we, if they know. had allowed us to do the work, this is what no, we no, would have done. Really, it, it was uh, waiting for Godot, of course. Godot, but what right. happened was uh, I, w uh, I did it uh, at Cornell and nobody bothered us, but then I was invited to a festival in Poland and they jumped in, you can't do it, and because I had three luckies and I had the uh, part of the audience on stage, uh, a few little changes, not in the text so much, but in the staging. So what I did is I said, I'll give a lecture about it instead. They said, okay. And the lecture was why I cannot do Waiting for Godot. Mm -hmm. And I began the lecture saying, to understand why I can't do it, I have to show you 
the offensive part, but they are in the context of the entire play, and therefore we have to do the play, but I'll stop it and, as an explanation. And, yeah, and the estate, the estate went nuts because they couldn't really stop. I'm a professor after all. I'm just giving a lecture. I'm giving it Can I uh, come back to this question of repetition because I'm interested in, uh, in relation to a kind of dramaturgy, I think, um, because I see there's this repetition that you're interested in in the work. And, I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more about um, th the use of that device as a theatrical device or as a performance device, but also what does that mean to audiences in Germany when they see the work? Do you, you, you mentioned that sometimes they get very annoyed, sometimes they... Why, are you, why, why is this a provocation to you or something? Um, Speak um, to the word, I guess. Yeah. Well, the uh, interesting thing is that uh, I'm so interested about different theater words in different languages, like repetition in French would mean rehearsal, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. la répétition. So, so it's, a, it's a totally different axis from what you would uh, call a repetition. And f for us also, I mean, we have had situations where we don't only repeat pieces in different ways and in different situations, but we also repeat scenes and we also repeat like a certain part of a piece that is not uh, inhaltlich, uh, uh, that is not defined by its content, mm -hmm. yeah, but mm -hmm. only by its place on the timeline. So it, uh, it's it's an idea that comes from from, from sampling, from pop music, from hip hop, yeah, where, where the, the people started taking little bits, that's again, that's this technique, yeah, uh, that I mean, and, and that you mean also, uh, taking little bits out of famous, then famous mm -hmm. pop, disco, etc. songs, and putting them together in very different ways, that are just long enough to somehow recognize mm -hmm. the thing, but that can, for example, instead of giving you a melody, like by whatever, Pony M, Abba, uh, uh, give you a rhythm, yeah, so, so um, I don't think that we are a group that is provocative because for that we are, in a way, <coughs> not enough vi virtuos. Virtu virtuous, yeah. Vir virtuoso, virtuosity. virtuosity yeah. Yeah. So, well, I mean, you can provoke by virtuosity, by having such a loud voice, by being so present on stage, by, by doing what the good old Volksbühne, um, uh, sure, Castor. You can also provoke by being un unvirtuosic. Yeah, 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 yes, you can, actually, yes, you can. Yeah. I, I never realize how that happens, but some people are really provoked by that. And then, um, <laughs> you can, and then I think a, an important technique generally in, in performance theater and for us is the length of, mm -hmm. of a thing. For example, when we did this blindfolded circle competition in uh, in in, in uh, his university, or when we do um, like uh, a, a, a very strict choreography about sport movements that we once did, I mean, it starts to make sense after 12 minutes. That's mm -hmm. just the way. When you sort of, as an audience, first you see something, you st you understand how it works. Well, very nice, but I've got enough of it now. I got it. Thank you. Then you get bored when it goes on a little bit longer, then uh, you start to accept it and to give up or something inside you, looking for content, looking for meaning, looking for aesthetics, gives up and something other comes, uh, which is a kind of antenna for atmosphere, for ritual, for rhythm, for music, for, yeah, uh, for the space. Uh, out of boredom, you start looking around. Uh, aha, there are other things happening. Mm -hmm. There are small changes. You start moving. So it's a repetition with variations. And uh, it's never with us. I, I can only speak about us in that case. It's never about, OK, let's, let's provoke these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. It's not about that. It seems to me uh, that from, from, the, from the 
brief exercises you had us doing this morning as well, that there has to be an element of that process that you're describing bringing the audience to also within the process of creating the work, that the, the exercises we were doing, um, you, you know, they were always with the caveat of, well, if we had more time to spend really yeah. doing this collider exercise, we would really start to understand the rules and you get so it's it's sort of like that it's it's like that same process from within it as a as a performer quasi performer um understanding the rules getting bored with them messing with them mm -hmm. um and really getting a feel for the for the the thing from the inside mm -hmm. um so is is that something that also is necessary for for you as performers is that a necessary process for you as, as performers before it can sort of mm -hmm. get to the audience I would say yes, totally yes. Um, some of my colleagues would say no, 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 no. <laughs> no, this is not uh, spontaneous anymore, this is not authentic anymore, this is boring, I know how it's done, or let's not practice it because anyway it's much better when I do it for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't know, we never found a solution to that question. <laughs> um, and we always fight about it, it's always <coughs> messy. But it turns out that sooner or later, due to the situation of theater, we have to repeat the stuff and we have to do it several times. And for me it's totally okay, I like it. Because, yeah, as we said, repetition is not possible. And yet we're not tape recorders. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So when we were talking at Ohio, uh, you mentioned that you think you're beginning to return to narrative. A little bit, and that, right. and that the this moment in Germany maybe is becoming a post post dramatic right. moment, or right. it's leaving the post dramatic in yes. some way. Yes. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. Uh, well, there is an anecdote <laughs> to <Yeah>. this. <coughs> in two thousand fourteen, we were invited to a big a Munich uh, um, device theater arts mm -hmm. festival called um, Spielart. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, we then were in that state that we said, okay, let's do a real theater piece for once. Mm -hmm. That was actually maybe in the beginning, that was a kind of provocation, mm -hmm. but more of our colleagues, yes? So, so when we staged it there and the stage technician uh, looked at it, um, we would start conversation a little bit. So what are you usually doing here in your great house? Ah, you wouldn't know, it's, it's not interesting for, it's, it's not at all what you do, it's, it's called performance theater. So at that point I thought, wow, uh, are we so much uh, in the classical sort of way uh, now that it wouldn't be recognized as originally coming from the performance? Mm. So th that was the first time I actually mm -hmm. thought, wow, are we in post-traumatic post uh, mm. epoch uh, now? Yeah. Um, Yes. Mm. Yes. I I um Yeah, I wonder if uh if you could talk a little bit about what um like for me uh what you just said sort of speaks to this. I think when when we're talking about the independent scene in in Germany um funding sources and, uh and the the funding structure and institutional structure um get sort of in, entangled with the question of aesthetics and it's sort of both like the independent scene is is sort of defined by on the one hand what is the the aesthetic of the Fayetzana and on the other hand uh, it's it's the Fayetzana because it's not state funded right. um, very true so I'm, I'm curious about how those mm -hmm. things are intertwined and, and if the Fayetzana mm -hmm. starts doing things that that are not in its aesthetic mm -hmm. and if mm -hmm. the post post dramatic starts to look again like the aesthetic of the state-funded theater, mm. is it no longer the independent scene? Or how, right. how necessary are the two things? What makes something Freizene? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I mean, that's a very, very uh, uh, political question and a very good mm -hmm. question. I've never thought uh, uh, about it uh, from that angle. Uh, so what is the point of, uh, from where you define it, yes? Is it a formal definition? non-national theater, 
we are working in national theatres, non-ensemble, no, that's definitely not true. We are ensembles, we are uh, people working together since 20, 25 years sometimes. So none of this works. The aesthetic may be they are trying to, well, who is they again, yes, we uh, are trying to, to get an, an, an aesthetic definition, which I think is wrong. Uh, but um, it turns out that um, the national theatres are for the fiction and for the narration and for the classical authors and for literary uh, li literatur theater, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, literary theater, literary yeah. theater. So and the freie, freie Szene is for working with non-professionals for for doing documentary theater for talking about actual political stuff like a living newspaper mm -hmm. and. Um, I think that's very dangerous. So I, when you ask me, I prefer the formal, the, the formal definition. But as you rightly said, also this definition doesn't work anymore. So let's all together uh, trash this. Maybe that's what I suggested in an article that I mm -hmm. wrote a few years ago. Freies um, Theater abschaffen. Let's let's trash the idea of uh, of uh, 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 national theater and free scene. Let's talk about theater, or let's even abolish this, let's talk about art. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious as you, if you have any uh, ongoing investigations into the reception of your work and how you intend your audience to experience it. I mean, I've heard you speak a lot about the process and the aesthetic investigations, but I don't know if the audience is a, a present component of your process, or if it, um, if you just simply want to invite them into what you've done and let them interpret how they will? Um, we think about the audience a lot without talking about them, because we don't know who they are and we don't, um, I'm, I'm very skeptical about these strategies of, uh, of um, like, uh, communication designers who, 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 who uh, was heißt denn Zielgruppe? I'm sorry, Matt. Um, target, uh, groups target groups. Target groups. Who, who define group. a target <laughs> group <laughs> and do what they think that this fiction of a target group might want and need. Maybe it works. Uh, maybe it works in economics, but I don't think that uh, scientifically speaking or philosophically speaking, this is a good uh, strategy. So, so what we do is we are in touch, of course, with our audiences. We are in live touch with them, and um, the experience is when, when an evening works well, uh, the audience stays for very long after the show, and there is a lot of informal discussion and talk, and uh, then we bring what we have heard from from you, from you, and no, no, no. different people from our group talk to different people. And then when we gather again for the next piece, yeah, but this didn't work. Uh, you know, Stephanie said that she saw that. <laughs> and that. No, uh, no, uh, uh, Matt told me that this was his favorite scene. <laughs> so that's how it works. So it's it's very unsystematic, but it's present some somehow. Plus, we are our own audiences because as we don't have a director, everybody steps out from time to time to look at what we are doing. As, a, as an anecdote, um, the idea of, ha of knowing who your audience is in German theater is so new that the word for it is audience relations. <laughs> that's like literally that's the German. They'll just yeah. be talking in German and they'll be like, oh, and we're doing, an audience, we're doing a survey so we can know a little bit about audience relations. Mm -hmm. um, it, because the lag time, the seats are subsidized in the German theater. So if nobody comes to a show, it's okay. If for several seasons nobody comes to a show, then it's not okay. Mm -hmm. But it takes, it takes a, a year or two years of failing before that's going to show up in, uh, in the government statistics. But, but there's also, I wonder that there's the tradition in the avant-garde of offending the audience. Mm. And intentionally, you know, from Ubuwa to wherever, uh, and it seems like part of what you're talking about, and I've seen it all around, is a much more comfortable relationship to the audience. And I think it's due to social media, to tell the truth. I think before social media, 
you could very clearly identify different classes of people. So you do something that's non-bourgeois, invite a bourgeois audience and blow their minds. But in, with social media, you're about to chicken, you're about to pluck the right people to come to your show. You know, Whatever their class background, they'll have a sensitivity. And so that it, I see less and less uh, intentionally offensive. The last group actually was years and years and years ago, like the Living Theater in Paradise now, wanted to get people upset and, uh, and so on. But it doesn't seem like you do, and uh, it doesn't seem like lots of people do. I mean, it's different now. Do you, do you think, uh, what do you think about that in terms of spectating an audience? Uh, well, uh, so, uh, there was w one situation where we unintentionally provoked um, with uh, Nazi superhumans are superior to you all, this, this Nazi trash thing, mm -hmm. um, when we went to Croatia with it, because, um, well, they, they were very perplexed about this idea to laugh about this mm -hmm. epoch. Um, and I would say that we have played some there, yes? We have played in, um, since, since 1998, we, we have kept uh, uh, showing our pieces there. Um, they have a sense of being provoked, and uh, there are also there are artists there who work very much on that level. Um, and in fact, what you say, I, also a thing that I learn, uh, I've never thought about it, but the the class structure is Different. wiped out. Yes, it's because social out. media allows you to take three people who are structurally bourgeois and put them someplace, right. and three people are going to. Uh, social media uh, uh, subverts classic mm. class structure. Marx and not not they didn't have that kind of uh, instant, broad-based uh, possibility of communication. Mm. A little bit it works. It worked in Munich where we did a, 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 a durational thing there, and uh, we thought that our usual audience would show up there, but it was a big like opera plus ballet plus uh, acting house, so the, the subscribers showed up in their fur coats. Mm. And um, that was a moment that I loved because they couldn't believe their eyes, but many of them chose to stay. Mm. So, so that is the kind of provo provocation that I would... But, and, and in Vienna, uh, uh, friends of ours, uh, they're called God's Entertainment. They stole, stole it from yeah. Forst Entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, they did Handke's uh, 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 Publikumsbeschimpfung. Yeah. Yeah. And also there it worked quite fine. Maybe it's... In Germany, theatre is not important, uh, socially, generally speaking, uh, since many years. And um, in, in Austria, I know that it is. There were even the parties uh, using artists as a... An, an argument, okay, now this will be our next uh, intendant of the Burgtheater. <laughs> so it's, it's a factor, yeah, yeah? and that, um, that, uh, das wirkt sich aus auf die, auf, um, it manifests, uh, they are provocable with yeah. this. <laughs> the Germans, no, come on, theater? Uh, <laughs> but could you, I mean, that, that's happened in Hungary and in Croatia as well, where, right-wing political parties yes. have put in yes. uh, quite reactionary and yeah. turned out some mm. theatre companies. Mm. And, the, and the very right-wing party in Germany, the AfD, has campaigns that they'll get rid of the Gorky Theatre in, in Berlin, that they'll, that they'll fire all the artists involved with the Gorky Theatre in Berlin, which is, they call themselves a post-migrant theatre, so it's a, a theatre really for immigrants and refugees uh, as artists. Um, but that's really, that's, that's a pretty extreme example. I, I, and the Volkswagen in Berlin is also a pretty extreme example of politics. Yeah, yeah, theater, we yeah. haven't talked about that. Yeah. Could we talk yeah. a little bit about that? I'm yeah. interested in your... Wow. <laughs> what, what you Everybody wants to hear about it. I don't know say about it, but it's, director, it is right? a very yeah. uh, um, contemporary moment in German mm. theater. It is. Um, it is. Well, um, I love the Volksbühne, and uh, uh, it was my one of my theater homes in Berlin for many years and I mean if somebody is like for a quarter of a century the boss of a theater it uh, it creates something like a family yes and um, even more than uh, than Kastorf's work I enjoyed 
the, the people that he surrounded himself with, like he, he had a philosopher, Markus Steinweg, mm -hmm. uh, who was regularly there in the Rote Salon giving uh, improvised uh, evenings of uh, live thinking, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that, uh, that happened there. Um, so I'm sad, but uh, this whole discussion was so disgusting to me somehow. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, bad taste. Uh, this this way of making somebody else impossible and of really uh, putting people to the pranger like uh, to, to be spat at yeah I, it was not appetizing when you saw all this uh, all these comments on Facebook you thought this is a totalitarian and nearly fascist way of uh, of thinking and um, maybe it's not so bad that after 25 years there is a change even for the worse, yeah, why not? So that's my very personal point of view. I would get killed by many people for saying this in the right now. I, I would say you're not alone among the independent theater groups anyway, and, and at least saying it's, it was time for a change. We, mm. we, should, we can do something new. Um, I'm not sure too many people are excited about Chris Derson, the um, the person, the museum person that they hired, um, but at the same time, and they just had an event at Temple Hall. Mm. A, a really neat That's looking a, event at yeah. Temple Hall, mm. actually. Mm. Um, mm. Um, I mean, interesting, but dance based. And, yeah, totally dance. And you know, one would say the the big names of European contemporary dance. Yeah, and um, yeah, it looked mm. kind of an exercise in. Something I'm not quite sure what, but yeah, <laughs> very stylistic or yeah. stylized. Yeah. And that was the outside space. It was on the airport. Uh, yeah. The airport was the old yeah. airport. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 And it had Teresa. Yeah. I'm afraid that not everyone in the room knows what we're talking about. I'm afraid that's the case, <laughs> probably too. You should explain it. Um, the the Volksbühne in Berlin was the major space for post-traumatic theater for the past 25 years. Uh, it was run by Frank Kastorf, um, a former GDR director. Um, his pieces never came to the US, so people in the US don't know him very well. Uh, but in Europe, he is maybe the most important theater director of the last 25 years, or certainly one of them. And the Volksbühne was the most important theater <coughs> in, in Germany, maybe in Europe, for 25 yeah, years. It's on yeah. Rosa Luxemburg Platz. Yeah, on Rosa, yeah, in, uh, certainly of the East, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it had an, it, a very anti um, attitude, just generally anti. They saw themselves as still being representatives in a certain way of the GDR. Um, and everybody knew that his contract was finally not going to be renewed, and it wasn't. Um, but they ended up hiring uh, Chris Derson, who was the uh, director of the Tate Modern in London um, and does not have a theater background. Uh, so if you look at his first season, it is an uninspiring first season, um, to say the least. Uh, uh, it, he also, be, uh, this is not totally his fault, but the ensemble was very, very upset and they were the great, greatest ensemble of actors in Germany and they all left. So it's no longer an ensemble-based theater, uh, which is which is a big loss. Also, I think is the is the kind of the very short story. Yeah. The Kastorf built, yeah, and then they all no, left when he when he was going crazy in the late in the, the early aughts, and then they all came back again. Um, uh, they maybe should have fired him around two thousand, uh, but luckily they didn't, and they had another great decade <laughs> after he settled down a little bit. So we're, yeah. we're have just, we have maybe five minutes left before we need to wrap up. I don't know if there were any sort of, if we want to like close in some particular way or bring it, bring it back to, to something or if anyone had a, a pressing question that they, that they didn't get to ask yet. Um, we'll also, just to say, we, can, we'll, um, we are going to go to the archive down down the street, around the corner, um, the Siegel Center has graciously sponsored some drink tickets and a couple of nacho platters. So we, there's also we can have we can have some informal conversation. Anyone who wants to come for that, um, but we should wrap up our more slightly more formal.
discussion? Um, I have a question. Yeah. That, I don't know, maybe will help too. I was wondering, so I don't know, since we're in the university and uh, some of us are, um, you know, theater theory people uh, or arts theory people, and I was wondering about uh, what do you think about the relations between, you know, practice and, and theory mm -hmm. and what, how does how does a more the theoretical contemplation of theater take place in your in your thinking about theater? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. It's, it's an important one. Um, well, uh, if you know the Gießen Institute for Applied mm -hmm. Theater Science, uh, Mr. Schechner has been there. Um, uh, this is more or less the program to uh, to to educate the people. Uh, not only to, to, to do performance, but also to talk about it and to be able to uh, contextualize it also on a very theoretical level and um, not to be so focused on theater, but also on other art forms, media, uh, especially literature was very important. We had uh, French, uh, Russian, uh, English, uh, uh, mm -hmm. American, etc. Mm -hmm. We had uh, literature courses, we had courses in music science, so um, what Andrzej Wirt uh, built there was a kind of study that didn't exist in Germany until then and that still is problematic mm -hmm. in a way because the theater classical theater practitioners would say, okay, these scientists they work with their head I work with my belly whatever that means mm -hmm. <laughs> nonsense yeah mm -hmm. total nonsense uh, not everybody is a belly dancer um, so so we like the idea to really and, and often that happens that for two three four weeks during rehearsals we sit in, uh, in a table situation and think and talk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how long are rehearsals usually um, on the average, I like them to be two months. My colleagues want less, but uh, <laughs> it's a pattern. Yeah. <laughs> so let's say six weeks. <laughs> Is that from concept to performing? Um, no, no. From concept, uh, we have to write it much earlier because we have to apply for money to make the production. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's not a co co this work, co co a commission, a commission work. So uh, that is done one and a half, two years earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But of course, the original concept, as soon as we start rehearsals, we have forgotten it. And we don't read it anymore. It's, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, can you say a little bit about, like, in the free scene, uh, about, I would say, like, transatlantic projects? So you have, um, you have on, a, on another level, you have in Europe, let's say, Gob Squad was a UK-based, um, yes. um, uh, like, like actors who came into Germany and they had projects with German actors. You have like on a larger scale, you have a Bob Wilson and Berlin Ensemble collaboration, or um, I think some students and Christian uh, Nubling they collaborate on a large project. But what about like for example the U.S. and and Germany? Uh, right. We we've talked about this a little bit uh, uh, at lunch. Um, mm -hmm. um, it it seems to be difficult to initiate for uh, European, US American corporations. Uh, very often, well, this is styled by the Bundeskulturstiftung, by the people I talked about. Um, at the moment, they think that everybody should work with people from Africa. So that's what everybody does. And maybe after five years, everybody will think, no, let's uh, work with US America again. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's, it's a fashion in a way. Uh, I personally, and I think my whole group, uh, being interested, as, as, I, as I said after the question of uh, uh, Mr. Schechner, um, uh, of the origins of performance theatre here in the US, we have a connection, but uh, the actual exchange is, in my opinion, I don't know what you think, Matt, it's quite rare. It's difficult because if you're going to, you send a curator a DVD, of a German production, they they don't necessarily have enough context to understand, and it's just a DVD. Mm -hmm. uh, groups like Gob Squad, who are uh, 
built as international have an easier time with that kind of exchange, I think, than groups that are much more local. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, so uh, as uh, uh, a lot of your work is based on the audience reaction and um, um, the, the live reaction, how can you really uh, rehearse something that is going to change in different times? We can, we times. can. We do tryouts, we invite friends, and uh, we see what happens, and maybe we adjust, which is also not safe because the next day there is a new audience. I mean, uh, in this uh, this piece about zombie Andy boys, uh, from town to town there were very different reactions. In Vienna, as I told, people are, have a lot of respect for theatre, so everybody was sitting in the space pss, pss, and listening to what <laughs> happened. In, in other places, people after five minutes ran out and looked at what we were doing around this uh, gerüst. So, um, yeah, you don't know. With such a piece, you don't know. Then, of course, we do other pieces that are more staged in a way. Yeah. So, how is that just part of the work, too? It's kind of um, really exciting part that is not really um, discovered yet, really, that is uh, happening live. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you see what I mean. That it's happening live. Yeah. Uh, that the kind of the process continues. Good. Um, great. Thank you both again so much for coming and talking to us. Um, this is really, it's really wonderful, I think, for me um, and for all of us. And thank you all for, for coming as well, um, for finding your way to this room on a Monday night. Um, also on behalf of the, of the Siegel Center and the Department of Theater. Um, it's really great. Uh, and I hope you'll all come around the corner to archive. Do you know what street it's on? It's on 36. 30, 36, yeah. So you're all welcome to, to come and join us there to hang out and talk more casually. Um, yeah, thank you both so much. Thank you.